beginning in verses uh, 4, and we'll go, we won't get as far as 37, but we'll get part way at least. So if you want to take a quick look um, at the front of that handout, you will see a little more uh, basic information for this next passage. Verses 17 and 18 are our key passages, but we will just begin to get into that. You'll look at the time. Notice that the time of this, uh, of this next part is exactly, not just Feast of Pentecost, but exactly 9 a.m. in the morning. That's pretty exact, isn't it, for a time? And um, then you'll see the maps. There are 15 different places. This will be as we get into it this morning. This is the first sermon ever preached by the new church. And we'll, we'll begin to get into that this morning. And then there are some other notes for you. And then as we begin the message this morning, if you want to take notes as we're talking, turn to the back side of the page. And on the back side of the page, you can take notes if you'd like to. If you say, I am no longer in school, I do not want to take notes, I'm just going to listen, that's okay too. No one will grade your paper. It's, it's up to you. It's up to you, but I trust it will be a, a blessing to you. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put that right there. Do you remember where we were in the book of Acts? We've done so much since September 17th. We've had two weeks of celebrations. We've had all, all the missionaries here. It, Acts seems like a long, long ago far away, doesn't it? But we come back this morning to one of the most exciting passages in the whole Bible, and certainly the highlight and the high point of the book of Acts, written by, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and written by Dr. Luke. And this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When God keeps his promise that Jesus gave the whole fa the Father will and I, the two of them working together, we will send the Holy Spirit. I will pour out my Spirit and you will receive power and you'll become my witnesses. And that's where we are. So it's the Feast of Pentecost. We've talked about this before. It's 50 days after Passover and 10 days since Jesus has returned to heaven. They have been meeting together where we don't know, but maybe in the upper room, maybe in the house of, uh, of John Mark, the mother of John Mark. Apparently she was well-to-do. She lived in Jerusalem and they gathered there. That may be, but we don't know where. They're gathered together. They're waiting for Jesus. They believe the words of Jesus. They, Jesus said very soon, very soon, the Father and I, we will send the Holy Spirit. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and you'll receive power. All they know is that Jesus has promised this and they believe Jesus. They believe Jesus. He keeps every promise. God, Psalm, uh, uh, Proverbs 30 verse 5, what is it? God keeps every promise He makes. How will the Holy Spirit be given? They don't know. What will happen? They don't know except that they will receive power. What will it look like? What will it feel like? They don't know any of these things. All they know is Jesus has promised. And so they're waiting and they're praying and they're meeting together. And as we looked at the last time when we were in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out. So let's look again just by way, as we, just by way of reminder as we get into our message this morning. Verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're meeting in one place. And what comes first? Are they baptized first? No. What's the first thing? And if you're keeping notes, you can see I've, it's obvious. You know, the answers are explanatory here. What is the first thing they, they experience? There's a sign. There's a, a, a symbol. There's something that gets their attention. What is it? The sound of wind. Is it wind? It is not wind. It's the sound of wind. Is it, or is it really great and big? It's great. The Bible says it was a mighty windstorm. It's big. It gets their attention. And as we're going to see very, very shortly, the wind, the sound of the wind was not just inside the room. The sound was in Jerusalem. It was in the city. Because as we're going to read, 
people were attracted by the sound and they came running. And that will come in verses 5, 6, and 7. We'll see that in just a minute. So first, it's the sound of wind. And it's a great wind. It's not just a little. It's big. Why wind? By way of review. Why wind? Where have we heard about wind before as we go back and look in the Bible? The word wind in Greek and in Hebrew. The word breath in Greek and in Hebrew are the same word. The same word. And so here we have this symbol. Symbol. The sound of the rushing wind. But immediately for them, because they were Jews, they could understand the symbolism of it, the meaning of this. It wasn't the reality yet. It was just a sign. And they understood when there's wind, where there's wind, there is life. It's the breath of God. Because as we read, where does this sound come from? From heaven. It comes from God. And so why is there wind? And what is the meaning and the significance of wind? It's the breath of God. It's the life of God. It is the activity of God in the very beginning. God makes Adam, but he's not yet alive. And then what does God do to bring life to a, to a lifeless form? He breathes, and Adam becomes a living being. We go a little bit later. What does Jesus tell Nicodemus? He says, the wind blows where it wants to. When you are born of the, the, you're born of the Spirit. And so he likens the Holy Spirit to wind. We remember Jesus on the night of his resurrection. He comes into the room where his disciples are. And what does he do? What does he do? He does what? <sighs> he breathes on them or he blows on them. And he says what? Receive the Holy Spirit. And for that first time, the Spirit of God comes to live in man and woman. For the first time since Adam and Eve. And Jesus, the Holy Spirit was in Jesus as well. We look at that in a different way though. But from the, for the first time since Adam and Eve, when they lost, when the Holy Spirit had to leave man. When the Holy Spirit could no longer make his home in men and women. And that was God's plan. God didn't just want to walk with Adam and Eve in the garden in the evening when it was cool. God wanted to be with his people always. God has always wanted to be with his people. God does not want to be far off from us. God wants to be with us. God wants to be with us in our good times. God wants to be with us in our bad times. And for the first First time, for the first time, Jesus breathed, and again, the Spirit of Holy God came to live with men and women, never to depart. Never to depart. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, that you lived for us, that you died for us, that you rose again for us, that the Holy God might live with you and me, be inside us always and forever. And so, when they heard the sound of the wind, oh, they understood what that meant. But I want us to look this morning very quickly at an Old Testament passage that as a child was one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. I loved it because, as I said in the first service, it was so weird and wonderful. And that's from the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. How many of you have heard of the Valley of Dry Bones? Yes? All of us have because we're adults. But in the first service this morning, Rebecca Garcia was sitting right back there. And I said, the Valley of Dry Bones. And Rebecca went, <laughs> like she'd not heard of the Valley of Dry Bones before. But this gives us a great picture. And this is not about Christians, and it's not about God bringing life to a person. This is God restoring the nation of Israel. When they had been scattered through all the other nations, there was no life. They were far from God. And then God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel, but this gives us a picture of the wind of, the, uh, of God, the breath of God bringing life. Look at it with me just very quickly. The Lord took Ezekiel. He was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. And then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? O oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. Verse 4, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones. Listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put, ah, what is he going to put? 
breath into you and make you live again. Verse 9, then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath from the four winds, breathe into these dead bodies so they may live again. This gives us a beautiful picture of the breath of God bringing life. How encouraging this should be. He did it in a nation. If God could do that for the nation of Israel, you don't think he can breathe life into your life and into my life, into your dead parts? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Verse 10, so I spoke as he commanded me and breath came into their bodies. Why did breath come to into their bodies? Because He is the Sovereign Lord. Because He is the Sovereign Lord. He controls it all. All power is in His hands. All authority is in His hands. And when the Sovereign Lord speaks, and when the Sovereign Lord moves, and when the Sovereign Lord breathes, something happens. Life comes again. Oh, I'm so glad. Brothers and sisters, we have hope in God. We have hope in God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so wind comes. The sound of wind. Sorry, keep me straight. The sound of wind comes. But it's a sign, right? It's, a, it's still a sign. What is next? We'll go back to the next, uh, back to, on to the next passage again. What is next? Fire. But is it really fire? It looks like fire, right? Nobody gets burned, okay? And it comes to rest on each head. Uh, tongues, of, tongues of fire, just like flames of fire. Oh, now, is it real fire? The Bible doesn't indicate that it is, but it looks like fire. And for the Jews, because they were all Jews in that room, they understood what fire meant too, didn't they? Why would God send the sign of fire at this point? Wind, whew, we understand. Fire. Why fire? Reminder. All the way back. Moses and the burning bush. Remember that? All the way back when a bush is burning and is not burned up. Moses goes to look at it and a voice out of the bush speaks to Moses and he understands it is God. God is in this. And so the fire from very early on, they understood it was a symbol of the presence of God. Remember as the children of Israel went through the wilderness, there was a pillar of cloud by day. What was it at night? Fire, a pillar of fire. So the presence of God with them. We come all the way to the New Testament, and we've talked about this before, but it's been a few weeks since we've come. John the Baptist talks about when, when the one comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Why fire? Why fire? So it's the presence of God. What else? What does fire do? Fire purifies. Fire burns up those things that are not needed, that are not necessary, that are chaff, that are not useful to the Lord. How many of you, before you became a Christian, there were things in your life, oh my goodness, all sorts of things in your life, and then you became a Christian. Not joined a church, you really became a Christian. And God, the Holy God, came and He began to live inside of you. And suddenly there were things in your life that couldn't stay anymore. Yes or no? Yes. Those things had to get out of there. Sometimes it takes time. I, I remember years, years, years ago when my cousin, almost my same age, had been far, far, far from God. So, so far. Had run away from home. So far from God. And then, then she and her boyfriend came back to the Lord and they were living, this was way back, this was in the hippie days, and they were living sort of in a commune. A whole bunch of them were living together. And the Spirit of God really was in her. She really had become a Christian. But do you know what she was still doing? She would get her Bible, because this was her background. It was all that she knew. She didn't know any better. She'd get her Bible, and then she'd get pot, marijuana, and she'd get high, and she'd read her Bible. Now, I'm not trying to make fun, and I'm not endorsing pot by any means. But God was doing a work in her. This, true, this is true. She, she, this was her testimony. She told me about it later. But after about two weeks, she realized something inside. She realized, I shouldn't be doing this. Nobody had to tell her, stop smoking pot. She stopped. Why? 
because the Holy Spirit was living in her, and the fire of the Holy Spirit began to purify her and began to clean her. And because it came from the inside, there was a life change. Brothers and sisters, you and I so often try to work on the outside. Yeah, don't do this, don't do that. But it takes the, and, and it, is good, there, it is good to have discipline in our Christian lives. It is, it is. But there is a transforming power of the Holy Spirit and a transforming work of the Holy Spirit that comes on the inside. And when it comes on the inside, it changes us and it takes care of these things. It really does. It takes care of things. And you know what? He's the same Holy Spirit and He still does that today if we will let Him if we invite Him to, if we will say yes, if we will respond to Him, if we'll keep our, so our hearts soft. Now, if some of you I offended just now by the story of my cousin, I'm sorry, but that's true. That's true. And the Holy Spirit took care of it in her life. Why? Because He's holy. Another good example, and I won't go into that because our time is short. Steve gives you a good example of that as well. And you, can t you say, Steve has a story? Oh yeah, I love Steve's story too. You talk with him about it after service. I'm sure he will be happy to give glory to God by telling you how the Holy Spirit transformed his party life, even after he became a Christian. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes us holy. He makes us like Jesus. And so the disciples understood the symbol of fire as it came. So two symbols, wind, sound of wind, the appearance of fire. And then came the third thing that was not a symbol. It was a reality. What was that? Mm. New languages. New languages. And suddenly, what happens? Suddenly, they were all filled. So there's the sign of the sound of wind. There's the sign of what appears to be fire. And then there is the reality, no longer a sign, of the filling of the Holy Spirit. And as they are filled, as they are filled, then what happens? Do they speak in tongues immediately? Is it wind, fire, tongues? No. No. Look at it. It's wind, fire, filled, and then tongues. Do you see that? They are filled, and as they are filled, then they begin to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So here we have something, not a sign. Although speaking in tongues is a sign, the Bible talks about that later. But this is an experience. This is a reality in their lives. As they begin to speak in new languages, they begin to speak in languages they've never heard studied. They begin to speak in languages they don't know. They begin to speak in languages they've never heard before, some of them. They begin to speak in languages and they don't know what they're saying. They don't know the interpretation. They don't know what's going on, but that's okay. God is doing something. So I want you to think about that for just a minute. So that's going on inside this room, wherever it is, this new reality. What is going on outside this room? What's going on outside the room in the city at this moment? It's the Feast of Pentecost, and it's right about 9 o'clock in the morning. It's actually a little bit before 9, because Peter starts to preach a little bit later, and then what does he say? It's 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm. Now, some of us might say, hmm, does that matter? Does it have to be specific? Why is it 9 in the morning? We'll talk about that in just a minute. So... The Holy Spirit is poured out. That's what's going on inside. What's going on outside? It's one of the three great feasts of the Jewish religion. It's the Feast of Pentecost. What has happened? People have come from all over the no their known world. So, uh, in the first service we talked about this. I don't think there were any Chinese Jews uh, on that day because when it says... When uh, from their own from their known world, when it talks about that, it talks it, they're talking about the Roman world of the of that time. So it would have been the Mediterranean part of Europe, part of uh, Asia, the northern parts of Africa in that area, and so. All of these people, they were pilgrims, they were devout, and they had come to Jerusalem because according to the law, according to the law that God had given, the law was if you were able-bodied 
And if you could go to Jerusalem for one of those, those three feasts, for actually for all three feasts, you were supposed to go to Jerusalem if you could. Not just men, women would go as well. Men, women, and children, whole families would go. And so the city was full of pilgrims from all over, devout pilgrims. I want us to get the picture of that this morning. People were there in that city. It was full. It was crowded. These people were devout. These people were sincere. But these people were limited in their understanding and in their experience. All they knew was their religious tradition. All they knew was what they had always done. All they knew was the law says, God said, more than a thousand years earlier, a thousand years, brothers and sisters, they had kept the law. And you know what the law said? On the Feast of Pentecost, you are to take not an animal, but because the Feast of Pentecost was a harvest festival, thanking God for the harvest, the end of the wheat harvest, the beginning of the barley harvest, you were to take flour from what you had harvested, the first grains, you were to grind it, you were to make it into two loaves, you were to bake it, and then you were to take it to the temple and offer those two loaves to God. That was the, that was the offering on the Feast of Pentecost. So, city crowded with people. They'd been doing this year after year after year after year with their two loaves to the temple. I must do what God says to do. I must do what the law says to do. And they were obediently following all that they knew to do. They weren't thinking about what was going on inside. They were walking through the streets with their two loaves of bread on the way to the temple to fulfill the requirements of the law. They're not thinking about some guy named Jesus who had been crucified 50 years earlier and was dead and gone. In fact, he probably was barely in their memories now. He's dead and gone. He's not around. I don't see him anywhere. They were thinking about, I've got to take these two loaves of grain to the, to the temple and offer them to the Lord. I've got to obey the law. They were, their minds were so far from some obscure Galilean who had been crucified by Rome and they had shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Instead, they wanted to fulfill and do what they knew to do in the law. But God has a different plan in mind for that day. He's finished with the traditions of the past. God is finished with the law that He Himself gave. Why is God finished with it? Why is it passed to God? Because Jesus, His Son, has come, has lived, has died, has fully fulfilled every requirement of the law and has raised, has been raised from the dead. So there's no more need for the law. The law is over and done with. And God has plans to interrupt their tradition and their ritual with a new reality. And the new reality is there's no need for the law anymore. There's no need to do this, 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 and this, and this. The time of grace has come. The time of God's favor has come. The time of Jesus, the sacrifice given once for all, never having to be given again, has come. And now, instead of going to a temple, instead of going to a priest, to give the offering, they can now boldly, as it says in Hebrews, they can boldly approach the throne of grace because of Jesus and there find help, mercy, and grace in the time of need. That's why Hebrews, a wonderful, wonderful book that talks about the, the service of Jesus, what Jesus has done for you and me and the grace of God that is poured out in our lives. And so the law, it's over and done with. I think... It must break the heart of God when He looks at this world full of people, even today, good people, people who are trying to do their best, people who are doing everything that they know to do to be good, 
people that are going through the rituals, people that are going through the motions, people that are doing, I must do this, and I must do this, and I must do this. When Jesus has come and done away with that, brothers and sisters, that's all past. It doesn't have to be done anymore. The reality of Jesus and the reality of that day came, and it's over and it's done with. And so God interrupts the ritual. What do we see next? Acts 2, 5 through 6. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. They'd come from all over. When they heard the loud noise, ah, there we now we know it, the, the noise wasn't just in the room, was it? The noise in some way had to have been in the city in some way. And it had to have been in some way that it came to the place where, they, where it came to wherever they were, wherever that was. I asked in the first service, Hong Kong, I think, is a pretty noisy city. You think? Yes. Can you think of some really noisy places in Hong Kong? Uh, noisy places and times. Causeway Bay anytime, says Marianne. Right. Causeway Bay anytime, especially Friday evening, huh? Hong hum, hum, rush hour. Somebody said, the fourth floor, Sunday lunch. <laughs> Actually, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Or, or I, I, I'm almost never, this tells you about my social life, so sorry. I'm almost never out and about in Hong Kong on Friday evenings. I'm usually home by then. But every once in a while, I'll get stuck somewhere in Hong Kong on a Friday evening. TST, or maybe hardly ever over on the island, and I'll sometimes I'll look around and I'll think, where are all these people coming from? <laughs> it's crowded, it's packed with people, and it's really noisy, isn't it? It's really, really noisy. It had to have been noisy in Jerusalem that morning. It had to have been. It was really noisy. Why? The city was full of people. The city was full of devout Jews that were there, for, the, for this festival, for this Feast of Pentecost. And then verse 6 tells us, when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. God has perfect timing. So they hear the sound, as far as I can tell, it's the sound of wind first that attracts them. But it's not the sound of wind that keeps their attention. What is it that keeps their attention? What is it? They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. Why are they bewildered? What's to say, what's to say that these people don't know these languages? Why are they so surprised? Let's see what comes next. Acts 2, 7 through 12. They were completely amazed. So here we see again, bewildered, amazed, and then go all the way down here, amazed and perplexed. That seems to be the general response to what, they, to what they're hearing and what they're seeing. So why are they amazed? How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. That's why they were amazed. That's why they were surprised. That's why they were bewildered. They couldn't figure it out. These people are from Galilee, and they understood and you say, well, what's the big deal about Galilee? Galilee was considered the most uneducated, backwards part of Israel, of Palestine. If you were from that area, remember when they found out that Jesus was from Palestine, was from Galilee? Do you remember that? Do you remember what something they said? Huh, can anything good come from Galilee? Now, you may have an area or a place in your home country that it's the same thing. Do you? Like this place or this area or, you know, maybe, huh? You know, I'm from the U.S. And sorry to say, I'm from the South, although I don't have a strong Southern accent, but I could if I wanted to. <laughs> and if you are from the South in the United States, you're considered kind of ignorant. Did you know that? When you talk like some of you knew that, you hear that and you think, oh, uneducated. Oh, listen to that accent. And Southerners, and at least where I'm from, a, a Southern accent is sort of, it's, it's laughed at in the United States. Even more for those from Galilee. If you're from Galilee, it, it was an uneducated backwards part of the, uh, of the land. And the Galileans, I did some research yesterday, the Galileans, even the way they, the vocabulary, and even the way they pronounced words, it was very rough 
it was often they would leave parts of the words out and sometimes even when they would speak they would say one thing and people would think they meant something else and they, they gave some examples from uh, uh, from from uh, biblical scholars and, and other scholars as well. And so when they look, even remember Peter the night when Jesus was in uh, was betrayed, remember he's warming himself by the fire. He speaks. He, does, he doesn't even say, I am from Galilee. He speaks and there's a servant girl. You go back and look. Uh, there's a servant girl who listens to him and says, you're from Galilee. It was very clear. It was very clear. So this is what amazes them. Here are these people from Galilee, but look, they're speaking all of these different languages. All of these different languages. All of these, okay, you count while I read how many different places or people groups. Ready? Verse 9. Here we are. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. How many? Fifteen. Fifteen different places or people group. And all the people came running and they said, we hear and we understand. And what were they talking about? The wonders, the wonderful things that God has done. And they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? What can this mean? Why are there so many different people from different places there at that time? Because it's the Feast of Pentecost. Why are there so many people in the streets to hear the sound of the rushing mighty wind? Because it's nine o'clock in the morning. You say, are you sure? Yep, I'm sure. If you go on and look a little bit later, you will see in verses, in verse 15, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. What's the big deal about 9 o'clock in the morning? Here's the big deal about 9 o'clock in the morning. In the Jewish custom and tradition and religion, there were two sacrifices every day. One was in the morning, one was in the afternoon. What time was the morning sacrifice? What time do you think, Sister Bridget? There you go. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock was the time of the morning sacrifice. God's timing is so perfect. Brothers and sisters, he could have done it in the middle of the night. He could, have done, he could have poured out the Holy Spirit in the middle of the day. This just reminds me and encourages me. God's timing is always perfect. And God chose exactly that time because he wanted people to know, I keep my promises. The prophecy, as we'll look at next week, there was a prophecy almost 700 years earlier. The prophecy was fulfilled. And God chose nine in the morning so that people would know and hear and see what he had done. And they listen. Oh, they're all speaking, but they're Galileans. How can this be? And they were so surprised and they were so perplexed. I encourage you later this week, not right now, in the middle of the sermon, in your notebooks, you've got a, you've got a map that was given to you in the very beginning. You say, no, I don't have it right now. It's in your folder at home. It's this one. And it looks like, it looks like this. You see how many of these places you can find on your map. You won't find all of them because some of them are outside the map. Some of them are over here. For example, Elam, we are Elamites. That was from old Persia, and that's way over here on this side. And you won't find any specific Arabs. That's down in here as well. But you'll find most of them on the map. So look for yourself on your own. So they hear these languages being spoken. I was thinking about this uh, yesterday as I was preparing. I was thinking about how God works with us as well so, so wonderfully. He interrupts what they're doing. He interrupts their tradition and he brings life. He gives life. He, he pushes away the tradition and the good works and all the things that have to be done for the law. And he does something different and he does something new and he does something real. And as I was thinking about this, I thought about a modern day Pentecost. If you will do any reading about church history, do you know what you will find? You will find from this point that we're reading about in the Bible all the way through history, 
when God has poured out His Spirit at various times, you will see some of these same things. You're not going to see, as far as I know, I haven't read about fire. Well, have, I have read about fire in a different way and, and haven't, haven't heard about more wind. But the whole, the whole reality of languages and different languages in my own family, in my own family, you say, are you sure? I could tell you all sorts of other people's stories, but in my own family, my grandfather and my grandmother, mom's parents, were German. Mom is 100% German. I'm 50%, although I, the only thing I can say in German is, do you speak German? That's all I can, <laughs> sprechen Sie Deutsch? And Robert says yes, because he speaks German. And that's all I know. That's all I, I can say a few things about sausages, I think, and things like that. And that's about it. My grandfather was German. And this just, for me, this really touched my heart as I was thinking about this yesterday because my grandfather was very much like these religious Jews that we're reading about this morning that were fulfilling a tradition. My grandfather and my grandmother were so religious they were such good people. They did everything they were supposed to do. They were in church every week, but they had no life in, the, in, their, in their hearts. The Spirit of God did not live in them. They just did what they were supposed to do. It was so legalistic. They wore long clothes that were dark and they, that were nothing bright, nothing shiny. Grandma would never wear makeup or earrings or because that was worldly. And, and I, no mirrors in their house because, you know, that would be, because that would be your being, yeah, Maui says, uh-uh, <laughs> because that would be proud, that'd be prideful, you're looking at yourself too much. Uh, things, that their, their background was, their background was Amish, I mean, they, they had been Amish, that was all they knew, and they were good, good people, but they didn't have a personal relationship with God, and my grandfather was a doctor, this was in the early 1900s. They lived in Washington, D.C., and I'm, I'm cutting, for the sake of time, I'm really cutting the short story. I promise you, true story, true story. And my grandfather saw this sign in the city, and the sign said, we pray for the sick, and God heals. And my grandfather thought, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life, because he was a doctor. He was a doctor. He said, what is that? And they were having meetings, and he thought, I'm going to go to that meeting and see what's going on. So he went into the meeting. It was loud. People were clapping their hands, and he thought, this is so disrespectful. Can you clap your hands in church? Other people had their hands raised, and he thought, what are they doing? Bunch of crazy people raising their hands, because he did not do that in his religious tradition. And then at the end of the service, they called people to come forward. Now we're going to pray. And this man walked up to the front to be prayed for. And my grandfather was a doctor, a medical doctor. And he looked at the man, and he could tell from the man's outward signs on his body, this man has heart trouble. And my grandfather thought, oh, no, they're going to pray for him. He's going to get all excited. He's going to have a heart attack. And so my grandfather went up to the front of the church to stand near this man that they were praying for so that he could revive him when he died from a heart attack, when he, had, when he had his heart attack. True story. So grandpa stood there ready to save this man, to help him as, as a medical doctor. And while he stood there, another man, uh, by the way, the man did not have a heart attack, and God healed him. But while they were praying, another man came up by Grandpa and stood there, and he began to praise the Lord. He praised the Lord, thanking the Lord for the wonderful things that God has done. Except this man was praising the Lord and praying in perfect German, high German, beautiful German, no grammatical mistakes, no mispronunciations, perfect German. And my grandfather understood every word. Why? Because he was German. And my grandfather spoke very good German. And he looked at him, he thought, hmm, so this man is an educated man. And my grandfather was very educated. And so after the service, my grandfather went to the man, and in German, he asked him, where are you from? Where did you learn to speak such excellent German? And the man looked at him, what? 
And my grandfather asked him again. He said, I don't understand you. And my grandfather thought, I don't believe. And this man said, I, I don't speak German. And my grandfather said, I heard you speaking German. The man said, I barely speak English very, very well. And he, in fact, was a very uneducated man. And my grandfather di didn't believe him, so he asked somebody else. And, they, and he was told, he said, it's true. He said, he that man doesn't speak German, and he's not very educated. I think just a, maybe two or three years of school education. From that moment on, my grandfather went to the Library of Congress in the United States and began researching about the Holy Spirit. And then he went back home, and he got my grandmother, and he said, we're going to this meeting. And he took grandma to the meeting, same religious background, and my grandmother and grandfather both, grandma especially, saved and literally within seconds filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a true story. There are other true stories. Keith can tell you one about a few years ago before B was baptized with the Holy Spirit in Tagaytay. She was sitting there and she heard my father speaking in other languages. My father did not know what he was saying, but B understood that he was praising the Lord and saying what wonderful things God had done. That was in Lighthouse, brothers and sisters. That was Beatrice Moody. That was God, the Holy Spirit. Our God has not changed. In my grandparents' lives, it changed their life because their life was full of religious tradition. They did all that they knew to do. They were good people. They did what was right, but they didn't have life. When the Holy Spirit comes into our situations, comes into our hearts, comes into our lives, brothers and sisters, He blows through all those traditions. He blows away those dead parts and be honest, brothers and sisters, you and I as Christians, we have some dead places in our lives sometimes, don't we? Don't you get full of doing it this way? You have your tradition, I have my tradition, I have my religious habit, you have your religious habit. When the Holy Spirit comes in and we give Him His space to work, and we give Him His place to work, and we say yes to Him and we surrender to Him, the Holy Spirit brings life. He brings life. In my family, I am here because the Holy Spirit prompted a man, gave him the ability to speak in German and praise the Lord next to a man who spoke German, my grandfather. And then my grandmother, and they gave birth to my mother, godly family. They grew up, grew up knowing and loving God, and I'm here today. That's the connection. That's the connection. God is still the same God, brothers and sisters. There are more, and there are wonderful stories. It's time to stop. I could tell you more that I know of personally. You could read books and read many more, but this is the same God. And I, this morning, as, as, I, as we close, and it's definitely time to close, I encourage you, don't just be bewildered or amazed by what I told you this morning about my grandfather. Don't just be amazed and perplexed. God, the Holy Spirit, has come to breathe life into our lives, to take those dead parts and make them alive again, to get rid of those religious traditions. Sometimes we're doing the best we know to do, but the Holy Spirit brings us into more. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you promised us, as we're going to read next week, that in the last days, you would pour out your Spirit on all flesh. On all flesh. So, Lord, I grab that promise. I'm part of that promise. That's for me. That's for me. And, Lord, that's for each one of us here. God, I pray as that you would help us as a church and as individuals to let your Holy Spirit 
breathe through our lives, blow through our lives, burn through our lives, and we say yes to you, and you bring new life into our lives. Oh God, we don't want to be bound by religious tradition the way we've always done it, the way our parents did it, the way we've been told in the past to do it, but you bring life and you bring new life into our lives. And so Holy Spirit, this morning we say yes to you again. We say yes to you again. Have your way in our lives. Take your place in our lives. Do your work in our lives that only you can do and that we cannot do, but you will do as we give you place and space in our lives, in our families, in our relationships, in this church. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.